Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the Residential Tenancies Authority webinar on the new rental laws for Queensland. That's the Housing Legislation Amendment, Bill, uh, Amendment Act 2021. So my name is Lynn Smith, I'm a Senior Community Education Officer and I've been with the RTA for just over 16 years in two areas, one in the education and previously in our dispute resolution area and have over 35 years experience dealing with all things tenancy laws. Today, I'm also joined um, by Sam Gaylor, who's from our Customer Experience Division, and that covers our bonds, our contact centre and our dispute resolution area. So thanks for joining me today, Sam. And for our audience, what's your role, your experience and how long have you been with the RTA? Well, thanks for having me, Lynn. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I've been at the RTA for about nine years, uh, starting in the contact centre. Uh, I have done some work in the dispute resolution team uh, and I'm currently the senior team leader for customer experience. Great. Thanks, Sam. So before I do start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we're holding today's webinar and where you are joining us from as well and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Oops, went too far, got my finger triggered happy there. Okay, so today's webinar, we're going to cover off on a overview of the changes that's been introduced and also look at what starts now and what's due to start. Also just a small disclaimer there, the RTA cannot provide you with legal advice and you are encouraged to make um, inform, get your own independent advice to make those informed decisions. Today we also want to hear from you. So our webinar will start with a poll very shortly to see who is in our audience today. We will have question session before we finish, so we'd love to receive your questions and please use the chat function or that little speech bubble that you see on your Zoom toolbar. Um, won't be doing the Q&A box, but just as I said, use that little chat function. I also have Michaeli from our outreach team sitting in the background to help with any technical issues, so thanks for joining in too, Michaeli. We also want to hear from you on how today went and importantly, what future topics you would like to know more about. So this is really important for us. So please look out for a survey at the end of the webinar. It takes honestly less than one minute to complete. So I'm just going to pull up our poll and get you to um, participate in that. So what we're asking is whereabouts in Queensland are you joining us today? And secondly, and which group in the rental sector do you identify with? So what we do know from the past webinars that we are able to reach people right across Queensland and even for those people who join us interstate. So remember each state and territory do have their own tenancy rules. Um, and also too, we also acknowledge that people's levels of experience in today's webinar is going to be different. And also the types of people in our audience. So whether you're a tenant or a property manager or an owner or working in the community sector. So I'll just leave that going for a moment. Okay, just to give you an idea. So we look like the bulk of people, um, obviously, in southeast Queensland. So we've got 19, uh, no, 32% in Brisbane, 40% in southeast Queensland. Welcome to North Queensland and central Queensland as well. And we have a couple of people from interstate. Um, and the majority of our audience today, we have 65% joining us that are property managers or agents and also to 23% um, for property owners or landlords. And we do welcome, we have tenants and we also have rooming accommodation providers and community housing and support workers in today's session as well. Thanks everybody for doing that. Okay, I shall just close that. Okay, so let's kick on. So our first topic, we're going to look backwards and looking at the reform process first. So the Queensland Government's aim with the rental reform is to provide better protection for landlords and tenants and improve the stability in the rental market. So again, taking that step back, let's look back 2018 to 19. There was a public consultation right across Queensland and Department of Housing received over 135,000 feedback responses as part of the Open Doors to Renting Reform consultation. You may have had that opportunity to participate at one of the stalls um, or write your own feedback at the time. It was quite a considerable campaign. So in 2019, as part of the Better Renting Future Roadmap that was released, 
there was a further 15,000 responses received as part of that community feedback. So then we have 2020, the COVID-19 emergency response regulations. And that was introduced in response to the health and economic impacts. And it was a temporary regulatory measure. And that was put in place to support the residential tenancies with, and some of that is still was in place till 2022. So our Minister for Housing is Minister Enoch, and she introduced the Housing Legislation Amendment Bill 2021. And that was in June. This impacted the tenancy laws and also retirement villages. However, we're only covering off today on that tenancy law part. So the bill then was considered by the Community Support and Services Committee. So if you follow the image on the screen on your right hand side, you will see the process and where we are up to now. The Parliament then debated the bill and it was passed on the 14th of October 2021. So the bill received assent from the governor on the 20th of October and that day it became law. So the Department of Communities, Housing and Digital Economy website that has a lot of information about the rental law, law reform and that process. And also too, a copy of the act can be downloaded or accessed from the government's legislation website. The RTA is underway to guide you and the rental sector through all the changes and we'll be doing that through a lot of different channels. So there are four main areas that we're going to be looking at. And also on your screen, you will see that the new amendment changes the existing Residential Tenancies and Roomy Accommodation Act 2008 and the regulations. And it will also repeal the COVID-19 emergency response regulation. So when does this come into effect? So from the 20th of October, there are two main topics, domestic and family violence provisions and also some changes with the death of a sole tenant. Both of these we're going to be covering on today. The dates have been announced for minimum housing standards to start. And I can reiterate now that these do not come into play until 1 September, 2023. And that's for new leases. And also too, from 1 September, 2024, for all of the tenancies. So there is time. And that's one of the messages just to remember that these are not straight away. These are coming in as a staged approach. So what is yet to have a start date or what we will say is we'll commence on a proclamation on a date yet to be set is the framework for negotiating renting with pets and also the changes to approved reasons to end the tenancy. Now, Sam, I'm just going to go throw over to you just before we start on these topics. We know there's some other changes. What do they represent in the new amendments? Thanks, Lynn. Uh, the new amendments, other than the, the main topics that we'll discuss today, uh, mainly tweaks to wording in the legislation. So some clarification, uh, corrections, and then the introduction of new forms, uh, which we can discuss uh, in a little while. So if we um, are looking at the new sections, how many sections have we added to our legislation? So there are four main sections that have been added uh, and changed. And then there's additional adjustments to area relating to death of a sole tenant. And then there are around 59 of those minor adjustments that I mentioned. Okay. So let's start now with the death of a sole tenancy amendments. These were previously captured under the RTRA Act, but what we have now is a new section and a, just a few little tweaks. So it's very similar to what we've had for a while now with the legislation. So either the landlord or the agent or the tenant's representative um, can give, it was two weeks notice, but it's now 14 days notice to end the tenancy. You can also have mutual agreement um, for an end date, or you could go to the tribunal, or if no one gives notice, then it's deemed to be one month after the tenant's passing. So the changes are, as I said, two weeks um, is now 14 days. Um, also, what's been added is an opportunity to withdraw a notice so a day can be agreed upon. And can I just say, look, let's face it, it is a very sensitive time. So really good communication between your tenant's representative and the owner or the agent is really important. What's also been added in is for the caravan park managers who have those short tenancies, that's now been changed um, to have a two days notice um, being put in. 
So the new laws that will repeal the COVID-19 emergency response regulations covering the DFE, the domestic and family violence. So you'll be most likely familiar with that process. However, there are a few changes and these have been based on learnings from the COVID-19 implementation. So I've broken this up into two parts, looking at first what a tenant can do and also to what the agents and landlords responsibilities are. So firstly, ending um, a tenant experiencing domestic and family violence can end their interest in the tenancy by giving seven days notice. Obviously they can leave early or they can leave immediately. They can also request their bond contribution to be refunded. And Sam, I'm gonna get you to talk about that process shortly. Um, tenants must give the landlord or agent supporting documentation and they cannot claim, and the agents or the landlords cannot claim relating costs where their interest is um, from the tenant, where their interest is actually ending due to DFE. So tenants experiencing domestic and family violence are not liable for property damage caused by the domestic and family violence experience and any remaining tenants will be asked to top up the bond and they need to do so. The other option available is that if the tenant wishes to stay, they can change the locks um, and obviously they will need to provide the owner with a copy. So over to you, Sam, in practical terms, just a couple things here. Let's step through these items. One of the ones is the owner cannot claim for the damage caused by domestic family violence. What happens if there's like other things such as like your rent or cleaning or gardening? Like what's the process here? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lynn. So you're correct. The legislation says that you can't claim for damage caused due to domestic and family violence, uh, but it doesn't make any reference to other costs. Uh, so yes, there is potential to claim those things. As always, though, we would encourage that communication with the vacating tenant. And to what's the process, like the changing of the locks mm. and also yep. to what's that process for that remaining tenants to do that bond top up? Where does, to it, how does bond, that work? Sure. Yep. Mm. So a tenant can change the locks to the property without requiring the owner's consent to ensure their safety. Uh, the owner then must not give a key for that changed lock to any person other than the tenant without the tenant's agreement or a, a reasonable excuse. So we might be looking there potentially at uh, allowing tradesmen. Again, that communication is gonna be, uh, gonna be really key on that. Um, topping up the bond. So if the, the vacating tenant leaves and there is a, a co-tenant remaining, then the managing party can require that remaining tenant to must top up the bond. Uh, again, communicating with the vacating tenant, and there's some, um, information to talk about with time requirements uh, around the notifying, um, but they would need to advise the, uh, the person who's vacated the tenancy that they were gonna uh, contact the remaining tenant. But we'll talk a little bit more in detail on that shortly. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Sam. So the Act also states that the lessor agent and providers must not disclose any information on the DFE, except where it's permitted. So Sam, I'm gonna come over to you, like privacy is really important. The RTA takes privacy very um, high priority. When would there be an example where someone would be allowed to for this to be permitted? No worries. Uh, some of the examples uh, around confidentiality, so where you'd be permitted to give that information, uh, they're actually identified under 308 I, uh, it's as required by law. So it might be, uh, whereas there's a, a lawyer uh, involved potentially, but they are really the only uh, the only circumstances. Mm. And as you said, that section 308 I is a new one and there's penalty provisions attached to that, isn't there, Sam? Yes, there absolutely is. Okay, yep, sorry. No, I was just gonna say the, the confidentiality side of it, uh, it's uh, 100 penalty units, I believe. Right. So it's, a, it's a significant, and I think that's um, you know, obviously speaking to the, uh, to the seriousness of the situation. Great. So if you have started a process under the COVID-19 regulations before 20 October, then you would need to continue that process. Sam, the last point that we've got is that the RTA no longer requires to receive the relevant um, evidence for a partial refund. 
that's new. Can you step me through that process? Yeah, absolutely. So yes, you're, you're quite right. Previously, the evidence needed to be provided to the RTA. That's now changed. That's no longer required. Uh, that information is required to be provided to the managing party. Uh, they talking through the uh, the refund process, then um, the vacating tenant potentially then ad advises us by ticking the box on the new form that we have. Um, you'll, I'm sure you'll take people through that. Uh, but the vacate date has then passed and then they can submit uh, a form claiming the refund. Okay. So now let's have a look at the really important information for your property managers, owners, and your rooming providers. So if you don't agree with the partial refund, you will be issued a notice of claim to respond to, and you can dispute the refund. You can also submit a bond refund on behalf of the vacate, vacating tenant, and that's using the new form 4A. Sam, when would an agent or an owner do this, and what happens with regards to like bond loans in this situation? Sure. Uh, so possibly uh, an agent or an owner might uh, might do this where uh, maybe they haven't been given the, the correct notice. Maybe they weren't made aware of the situation. Uh, with regards to the bond loans, uh, the RTA is unable to process uh, refunds where there is a, a bond loan in this situation. We would refer the customer to uh, to discuss with the Department of Housing directly. Okay. And the last part there is that if you don't agree with the vacating tenant, you can apply to QCAT within seven days for an application to set aside a notice ending a tenancy interest. And you must inform the vacating tenant that that is your intention to apply. And we'll go through what those forms um, look like, um, that notice ending a tenancy interest. So continuing interest notice must also be provided to the remaining tenants. And it's that you've got to strictly issue that between seven to 14 days after the person's left and not before the seven days. So the owners and agents must tell the vacating tenant when they are going to be providing this notice. Remember, safety and confidentially is a priority in all DFE situations. Now, there could be a situation where you may have gone off to QCAT to dispute a notice, um, and that might be going through that process. And also, too, there might be that notice of claim process for the bond that's still running. So, Sam, can you explain to everyone today what this really means? Because this is where potentially some confusion can actually occur, but they are actually two separate processes, aren't they? Absolutely. Uh, so there is a, a little bit to get right here, I guess, to make sure that we cover. Uh, so if a managing party, whether that be a, an agent or an owner, wishes to have QCAT set aside that notice ending tenancy interest, they must apply directly to QCAT and, as you said, advise the vacating tenant they're doing so. If they wish to dispute the bond, they must respond to the RTA. So we would issue a notice of claim. They must respond to that with a dispute resolution request. So they must advise us that they wish to dispute. Uh, they need to do both of those processes. They're separate processes and they won't inform each other. Uh, just a, as a note on that as well, QCAT will look at whether the notice has been given correctly, but not whether domestic and family violence has occurred. Uh, the other part I'd just like to talk about um, briefly on the refund process. So the idea is that it's agreed by the vacating tenant and the managing, managing party. Otherwise, we send out that notice of claim to the managing party only. You can't use our web services for uh, this particular process. You must use the new form, the form 4A. But if you're wishing to dispute uh, or respond to that, then you can use web services for that. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Okay. Let's just have a look now at the new forms so that you're familiar with them. Uh, first one is notice ending tenancy interest. This is the form that the tenant experiencing domestic and family violence and is wishing to vacate, they would use this form, okay? This particular one is the DFE for, uh, report. So Sam, who can complete this? And obviously this is going to be attached with the notice of ending tenancy interest as further um, evidence, I suppose, to the situation. So who can complete the form? 
So uh, it's actually listed on the form, but it's authorised professionals. Uh, it's also no listed on the notice ending tenancy interest. It includes health practitioners. I won't go through all of them, but health practitioners, solicitors, social workers, uh, domestic and family violence support workers are some of the people that can complete that form. Great. Okay. We have a new form 4A. So this is a bond refund for persons experiencing domestic and family violence. So this is for that partial bond refund for the contribution part. So you can access all of these forms on our website. And the other form that we've got here on your screen, you'll see is one that's called continuing interest notice. Again, accessing all from our website. And this is the one that's got that seven to 14 day time frame. So it's very clear when that can actually be issued. Okay, so just a reminder too, other RTA forms have had minor updates to reflect the amendments. And that also does include the pocket guide for tenants. So please make sure you always download or use the latest versions just to make sure that you are compliant. Next topic, minimum housing standards. But we have a list on our screen here. Um, this is what we're looking at is structurally sound properties, locks on windows and doors, free from vermin, damp and mould, and overall fixtures and fittings are in good repair, just to name some. So Sam, just going to throw it back over to you. Can you let us know some of the history behind this particular section? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'll just a brief little bit of history. Uh, so in 2017, uh, there was a, an inclusion added to the current legislation as it was then. Uh, it was part of the government's housing legislation amendment bill, uh, 2017, which was known as the Building Better Futures. So the inclusion was essentially introducing into the legislation the ability to have prescribed minimum housing standards added to the legislation. But at that point, there were no details of what that particularly related to. Uh, the new uh, introductions, as we can see on the screen there, talk to the specific areas that will come under the minimum housing standards. Okay. Do you know what, Sam, we're going to stop. We've got, just so we can go back and address some of the domestic and family violence and the other questions that's come mm -hmm. through. So just bear with me, I'm just going to scroll back through here. Thanks, McCarthy, for um, sending through some links for everybody. Um, so as you see in your chat, you'll see the links to the Department's Reform website and also where you can download the um, Act as well. So we have a question, Sam, death of a tenant. What if there's no contactable or identified relative, friend or representative for the deceased person? Uh, so I think you, you mentioned in that, uh, essentially, if there is no um, official ending uh, of it, if there's no mutual agreement, uh, then it would end one month uh, from the from that date. After the tenth passing. And yep. look, yeah, it might be a case of um, if you're looking, um, Diana, thanks for the question. If you're looking mm. for someone, they, there might be a neighbour might know where there might be some other family people located or something like that. But usually you find... Um, behind the scenes, most owners and agents will find a next of kin as part of their application process. So hopefully um, get that in place as well for all your um, tenants, just on the off chance. Um, Ken costs, so Kevin, you've got a couple of questions here. So I just want to um, bear with me. There's a, a little trail there. So can costs be claimed by the alleged perpetrator of the DFE. So I'm assuming that the statements indicating that the cost cannot be claimed from the victim of domestic and filing, uh, of domestic and family violence, um, or we're looking to rem like the remaining co-tenant that's left behind, I'm um, assuming again, once the victim has left, can you claim damage from them? Yeah, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for the question. Um, if we're talking about the two co-tenants, then uh, they can't claim costs from each other. It would be obviously related to the, the tenancy. There will be many different scenarios that will come through and we'll work through uh, a number of those. Uh, certainly, I don't think the intention is for, um, for costs to be claimed in that way. The bond is security on the property. Uh, you know, it's uh, ultimately, if there was a dispute, it would be able to progress through the QCAT and they would make a, a ruling on that sort of situation. 
Okay, one last question before we keep going. And remember guys, you can use that chat function to ask your questions. We've got a question from Maurice. Um, is it one month after the passing for rooming accommodation? So I'm assuming this comes back to the death of a sole tenant again, Sam? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I'm probably going to defer to your knowledge on that, Lynn. Otherwise, I can look it up and uh, yeah, and I will. Would you mind just confirming? Because I, I yeah, think I'll it confirm is. that and uh, um, we'll come back to but, you. But um, I suppose we focus a little bit now on the um, journal teams and stuff. So, but yeah, there is some we do. definitely some time frames for rooming. So whilst I keep going, um, Sam, right. I might just um, get you just to clarify that one for me. Just uh, just really quickly as well, Lynn. Uh, Kevin had a, another comment on there around the use of language, uh, and I think it's a really important point. So thank you for that, Kevin. Mm -hmm. We'll, we'll get more, I think, polished uh, in our language. We don't want to refer to uh, perpetrator as if we know the, no, the situation. Mm. Um, so it's a, it's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's keep going. So I'll get you to um, do some research on that one for me before we finish up for the morning. No problem. So with minimum housing standards, remember the lessor's general obligations is still in play under Section 185 as one of the property owner's main responsibilities for tenancy law. So ensuring the premises are clean fit for the tenant to live in, not in breach of any health and safety laws, and while the tenancy continues, they carry out repairs. And we've done many webinars in the past reiterating this particular section in regards to maintenance issues because that is a common topic that we receive in our call centre, as well as our dispute area. So the minimum housing standards, remember this does not start now. I don't want to have any confusion. This is a staged approach and starts 1 September 2023 for new tenancies and all remaining tenancies from 1 September 2024. Okay, let's have a look at the other topics that's coming into play. So the new pet laws have not started yet. So in other words, a date's got to be determined first by the government. So the current laws still apply. So the tenants will need to have the owner or agent's permission to have a pet. The tenancy or rooming agreement will state if a pet has been approved, yes or no, and the type of pet. So it's important to put down exactly that type of pet. So the new laws are going to allow a framework to negotiate renting with a pet. What we do know is that the tenant can seek permission and the owner or the agent can only refuse a request on identified reasonable grounds and they need to respond within 14 days. These grounds are yet to be determined. So just clarifying that. So if a pet is allowed, the owner or agent may then be subject to putting down some reasonable conditions. So it may be that um, also too, fair wear and tear uh, won't be considered with your um, pets. And also you might be putting something down as staying out, the pet needs to stay outside or that there might be some carpet or pest control done. They cannot ask for additional money like a pet bond. So just to be very clear on that. So to look at the last topic here on ending a tenancy again, this has not started yet. This is one of those ones, a date that needs to be determined by the government. So the new grounds have been added to end a tenancy, and that's going to include the end of a fixed term. An owner may wanting to be looking to undertake significant repairs or renovations, change of use, sale of the property, and one that will be also introduced for the tenants will be the ability to end the tenancy due to the property not being good repair or complying with those minimum housing standards. Again, can I just say, it's not started yet. So the same reasons and terms that have been in place currently still do apply. So I know, Sam, that we do get a lot of questions currently that's just coming through since the legislation's um, been passed um, about periodic tenancies. How will this kind of work in ending one of those? Mm. Uh, it is an interesting question and understandably, yes, uh, there's a lot of interest around that. So as you said, the, this part of the bill has not yet commenced uh, and we'll work through some of those various questions as we move closer to that uh, implementation date. Uh, the provision of new reasons to end a tenancy, so the, there are additional reasons added, such as undertaking repairs, uh, selling the property, will hopefully mm -hmm. make, it, uh, make it clearer as to what why the tenancy is ending. Um, 
but with regards to ending a, a periodic tenancy, it may continue if there isn't one of these uh, allowed reasons to end the tenancy. Bearing in mind, though, that uh, if the tenant's not meeting their obligations, uh, then there's the usual breach process to follow in that. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Okay, just quickly, where to from here? So remember, this is a staged approach. Not everything's going to start now. And the RTA is going to continue to support you and the rental sector with information and resources, particularly keeping you informed as we await the start date for that new framework for pets and those approved reasons to end the tenancy. So please bear with us as we get those dates and then we will be able to inform you with more information. So just quickly looking at our future education that we've got. So for Gladstone region viewers, you will soon be able to receive, or you will soon be receiving an invitation to attend a virtual information session um, for both agents and landlords. So please look out for that invitation later in November, uh, before the session later in November. And we do also know too that you, most of you have already probably signed up for our monthly news, but if you know someone else who would benefit from being kept up to date with tense information, and particularly as we go through the new legislation, please get them to sign up through our website as well. Our podcasts, Talking Tendencies, are regularly released on various topics. And we're also going to be continuing with our monthly webinars. And that's on tenancy laws and other various tenancy topics, just to make sure we keep you better informed and compliant with the Queensland tenancy legislation. Okay, Sam, so I think we have some more questions coming through. So again, please use that little chat function. Um, and we can um, come back to you with your answers to your questions. Sam, have you had a chance to um, help Maurice in relation to... I have, you? yes. I've, uh, I've run away. Uh, no, you didn't. It might look like I was still here, but I, I was running away on the, on another screen. 14 days is the time frame for uh, rooming accommodation. So thank you for the question, Maurice. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. So Paula is asking a question. How do we keep our staff safe? Um, is there potentially dealing with a violent person trying to increase the bond and checking the property for any damage that can be claimed that was not due to the violence? So I suppose that kind of comes down to your own business practices, Paula, um, of what you've actually got in place. It's probably a little bit beyond the RTA's role from that regard. Um, but obviously, you know, if anything does occur, you know, you're obviously talking to, with the um, your local police as well, but um, again, we would look at your own business practices from that regard, um, just to keep your staff safe. Um, so Kevin's back on board again with us. Thanks, Kevin. So regarding locks on windows, is it um, very common in Cairns uh, homes for all windows to have security grills? Do security grills override the necessary for a device on a window, which obviously I'm going to assume does a security screen match a lock on a window? Mm, it's a good thoughts, question. Sam? Yeah, uh, we, we can't really get into um, specifics uh, in that kind of regard, uh, other than requirements. If there is a, a lock, if, there is, if there's a lock with a key, then the keys need to be provided to, uh, to all of the tenants. We're just talking a normal tenancy. Um, I guess if, if we're talking about the changing of uh, of locks where there's domestic and family violence, the requirements would still uh, still apply in that regard. So I'm not sure whether they override the, necess the necessity. Uh, we don't define what, uh, what constitutes at mm. this point uh, safe and secure, but it may be something that there's clarity on with minimum housing standards. Yeah, and as I said, it, it just says a window uh, locks on doors and windows yep. and that's all we can be guided by. Thanks, yep. Kevin. Uh, Tony, thank you for your comment um, in relation to the wait times for the new laws. Um, Arvin is asking, what are the requirements for ending based on government statutory requirements? So I'm just not quite sure, Arvin, what you're actually asking there. Are you looking at it, whether a tenant is um, ending their government um, support services or things like that i'm not quite sure um, but maybe if you can clarify a little bit more there we can probably try and get back to you for that one um, the 
Dana is asking, just to clarify, the end of a fixed term contract, should we give any reason to tenants for not renewing the contract? So, for example, I want to rent my property to someone else. Um, so, I mean, the Act, when it does um, the new, when we do have a start time frame, the end of a fixed term is one of the reasons that you can actually end a tenancy, correct, Sam? Yes. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Dean is also asking how to deal with a cat smell and carpet. I suppose so, yeah. yeah, it comes down to, even though these legislation, and clarify if I'm right here, Sam, mm. even though these legislation changes are coming in, it still doesn't stop the other part of the legislation requirements under Section 188 for which is the tenant is to return the property in the same condition, less spare wear and tear. Now, I am actually removing myself in relation to the DFE situation, just in relation to dealing with, like, if there is pet damage or, like, in Dina's situation, she's asking about a cat smell. Um, you know, obviously, the carpets, if they've got um, smell in it, obviously needs to be rectified. And that would go back to the um, tenant's cost to rectify that. You agree, Sam? Yeah, it. it the fundamentals don't change. They're still required to return the property as close to the original condition as when they first moved in, fair wear and tear accepted. Um, if if it's you know, a cat, uh, and we know that you know, cat smell can be, a, can be a real thing, then their requirement, if it wasn't there at the start of the tenancy, is that it not be there at the end of the tenancy. Uh, and that potentially becomes a, a claim on the bond if that's not rectified. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going back, Morris. Obviously, you're doing roomy accommodation, so thanks for joining us today. Um, your 17A, that's the information statement pocket guide that needs to be handed to a tenant um, for general tenancies. There isn't actually a requirement. There is a requirement, though, under the R18 to actually give information, um, certain information to the tenant. That's covered with the Residential Services Accreditation Act as well. Um, I think what you find there, Morris, is watch this space. Um, we will look at that. But if you are doing room accommodation and you opt into general tenancies, which is one of the requirements, which is one of the options that you do have available, then you would actually be required to give that 17A. Amanda's asking some questions, Sam, about minimum housing standards, hmm. vermin and pest control, that lovely pest control one that comes up now and probably in the future as well. Uh, is it the owner's responsibility throughout the tenancy or just at the commencement? Yeah, so uh, vermin pest control it will depend on the reasons for the vermin or the pest being there. So if it was down to a tenant's actions, for instance, then that would be the tenant's responsibility. Uh, if it was not down to the tenant's actions, it uh, it's down to the condition of the property, for instance, and that's where it's going to tie into the minimum housing standards, then that would be the owner's responsibility. Mm. So just a quick little question here from Amanda um, in, oops, sorry, got a few things popped in there, sorry. Uh, privacy coverings, yes, that means your curtains or your blinds, things on your windows um, will need to be provided. Robin's also asking just in relation to minimum housing standards, again mm. there, Sam, locks yep. on windows do they need to be key locks or normal locks and i don't think that's actually been stated has it no i don't believe so um yeah we'll we'll hopefully have more information on that as we progress through it yeah um dina you've come back in relation to um pets um pets and everything at this stage can a landlord ask for compulsory bond clean and pest control, uh, no, you cannot ask. There's no, you cannot ask for bond clean. That comes back to the same um, section as I mentioned before. The tenant is to return the property in same condition, less fair wear and tear. So what we're talking about is that if the place was clean at the start to a certain standard or to a certain um, condition, and that's evident, then the tenant will need to return the property in the same condition, less fair wear and tear. Um, is the two months no ground standing for ending a tenancy? Sam? Uh, if we're looking at uh, the, no. the current, then yes, that's, um, that's the current process, but uh, the, uh, the changes that will be coming in, uh, the without grounds uh, will be removed, so there will need to be a specific reason for ending the tenancy. 
look, I'm a little bit conscious of time. We have um, hit our time today, but um, does it just from Norella? Thanks, Norella, for joining us. Does change of use include when an owner wants to live in a rental property, or is that another reason that uh, tenancy can end? Yeah, I believe that's um, certainly related to the proposed. Uh, changes. Uh, that may be one of the specific reasons. Um, there's proviso or provisions around that as well, though, that um, you can't just say, for instance, that you're going to sell the property uh, and then you know, the, the tenant leaves on that basis and then you suddenly change your mind the next day. There are uh, some checks and balances around that to ensure that, uh, that things are being done fairly. Yeah, fair enough. Thanks everyone for your questions. Um, look again, um, just to let you know, a copy of our webinar will be available within the week. Um, so look out for that on our website if you do need to share that with your team or with other people just to get them up to date. So our website has a lot of information, our forms and resources in the game. Please make sure you are using the latest version of our RTA forms. Um, and that's at our website at rta.qld.gov.au. Um, and also, too, you can contact our friendly contact centre staff, 1300 366 311. We're here Monday to Friday, 8.30am to 5pm. Thanks again for joining me this morning, Sam. Um, and I look forward to having you join me next time or, um, yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Look, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to jump on here and uh, and have a talk about this, and hopefully uh, help inform the sector. Uh, as you said, remember if if people have questions, please phone our contact centre if you need help. Yeah, and just a couple of questions just coming in last as well is that um, we will have more information in relation to the. Um, minimum housing standards, the, the framework for the pets, and also the ending of the tenancy. This is actually going to be coming through once we know more information and a bit more finer details, we will be sharing that with, the, with you and the rental sector. So again, thanks on behalf of Sam and myself. Remember that survey is going to come up shortly um, when the webinar closes. So please take that opportunity to provide us with some feedback and particularly what topics you want to know more about. Um, the survey takes about one minute to complete. So I really would appreciate that so that we know. So again, on behalf of Sam and myself, thanks for joining us today.